by the time he did the introduction and the time I got myself ready to walk out and uh, realize this red dot and all of this, there's so many instructions that went through um, my brain. Or is it somewhere else other than the brain? Uh, to Plato and Aristotle, uh, they thought that the soul was what governs the sense and sensation uh, about a thousand years ago. And that's divided between three compartments, being the brain, the heart, and the gut. Where Aristotle actually deferred from that, that the heart is the most important one. And Plato thought the brain was the most important one. Several hundred years later, it remained to be that um, maybe it's the antenna that communicate with God, or maybe it's the cooling and air conditioning unit for the blood. Uh, we haven't really departed much from these thoughts. Meaning, what do we know today about this gooey two, three pounds? How many billions of neurons? How many trillions of other uh, space uh, content that we are not aware of? Is it electrical? Is it chemical? Is it optical? What one thing is settled through dissection is that it's an electrical machine and a chemical machine. I am by training an actually mathematician. And I worked in the government and um, in technology for a good portion of my life. Uh, coming to a point in my life where I actually encountered uh, firsthand what happens to uh, have a debilitating TBI, traumatic brain injury. So I decided to actually change career and go study medicine. As I went and I studied medicine, I learned about things that we don't know about the brain. For example, how is it that we have such a cognitive, enormous cognitive throughput with very little power? And when you try to emulate the same thing in a cat's cortex, this is my cat, Oxford, who since have ran away. Maybe somebody had actually given her intelligence what I was going to do with her, but I don't know. Um, the, the paradox to this day has not been solved. The other thing you see in this chart, these are a lot of the pharma agents and how they interact. It's almost like a, a game of whack-a-mole. You fix one problem if a person has an anxiety, and you dampen another problem. Uh, if the person has major depression, you fix one problem. It causes other problems, and so forth. Neurodegenerative disorders, we know very little about. Alzheimer, Parkinson, uh, I don't wish that anybody experience the horrific uh, uh, experiences that comes with the, this type of debilitating disorders, where a person loses complete dignity, their ability to walk, their ability to express themselves, the very natural faculties that are endowed to every human is gone. So that triggered my interest in investigating this area and going into looking into what is really um, uh, the brain uh, sort of secret key uh, that I can make use of it and I can actually interact with it. A lot of people here are actually uh, in IT, so the concept of a substrate and the concept of a, a binary language, a basic, a basic language, um, on a bus, on, 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 a, on, a, on an actual surface that you are uh, uh, planting, um, needs to exist uh, in these modalities that are, that, that are flowing through the brain, like the chemicals, the electrical, and optical. Uh, so we investigated that, and we came up with a concept called the fundamental code unit. Um, it's essentially the assembly language of the brain, which enables us to be able to listen to the neurons and create a modulation pattern, a way to cancel out some of the bad signals or some of the bad things that are causing this uh, uh, tremors and whatnot, uh, and um, silence some of the neurons, um, write to them, and read from them. It's essentially like Morse code. So the brain has the density a density of geometry of 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the minus 16. It's almost like a deep forest. If you are actually a neuron between you and the next neuron, 
you have a huge space. So you're communicating somehow. And the messaging that came to us in the last thousand years of research is that this communication happening through chemicals or happening through electrical. In fact, we propose that actually what happens is an optical or the use of light. There's actually light. Evolution did not cause the eyes to extend all the way out of the skull uh, just for no reason. There must be a really good reason uh, that it needs light. And we make use of these lights in some of the work that we do. That triggered the creation of a device that interfaces with the brain and the neuronal level, on a neuronal level that is able to read and write from the neurons, be able to silence the ones that are causing the problem, or activate them, or help the regrowth. This process is known as deep brain stimulation. It exists today, but it exists in a very, very horrific and difficult way of uh, grasping, because you're running wires into the skull through a deep brain uh, part called the subthalamic nucleus, uh, or the substantia nigra, and you're stimulating in these areas uh, one to a hundred million or so neurons, so you don't have the level of precision and resolution that is needed to actually solve the problem. So we invented a way of using um, carbon nanotubes material to create a chip that is small enough that can actually penetrate and be planted in this deep cortical spaces. And in doing so, you are able to actually communicate with the neurons and write and, off, write and read these conditions of disorder. This chip is not about the future, it's about now. It is right here on my hand. And we are actually ready to implant it in the next time. I don't know if you can see it. It's very, very small. It's about two millimeter in size. And um, in the cases of disorders that require a substantial amount of these chips in the brain, we have designed an additional layer that is called the propagator, which is approximately um, capable of driving about 64 devices in one given uh, cortex. So here it is. What we thought to be the future, it is actually now. It comes with a lot of ethical implications. It comes with a lot of responsibilities um, for both us, the designers, the engineers, uh, the people that are actually uh, orchestrating this type of future, and for those who actually use it. That created actually two type of, well actually before I say that, this is just a, an illustration that shows you um, what makes this possible. The chipsets of the old days used to be a rack this big and it got shrunk down to a substantial size um, that it's amazingly uh, versatile and, and, and useful. So. The future uses of this is being able to actually go in and say, as a person with a PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and they have some memories, just like what my uh, uh, colleagues in the prior talk uh, presented, and you have an episodic memory or short or long-term memory, you would be able to actually go and read and write and silence some of these memories and change them. You would be able to change the human capacity in capturing language you'd be able to actually do a query in your head and get it projected in your V1 on your virtual cortex without having to use keyboard and screens and all those different things. So we moved from the quantitative self era to the augmented self era. A lot of people have goals to actually augment the machine to be like a human, or a human to be like a machine. What we are simply doing is restoring human, their dignity, when it's lost by a disease. And with that, I'll leave you, and thank you for listening.
Thank you.